Good morning, everyone. I've got about a half a dozen announcements for you. Let's start with the beginning. Camperships are available for those kids that want to go to. In fact, there's no age limit, so up to 90, 95, maybe they'd like to go. Interested? We have several camperships, and they are covering the entire expense, but we need to have you call the office for availabilities. Tools for a disciple maker. This is something that we probably need in our church, and that's what we can how to invite your family, your friends, the unchurched to come to our church and be a part of who we are. Uh, there is a there's actually a formula for that, and it works pretty well. Uh, it will help us in the long run and into the future. I read this last week, the mayor's prayer breakfast on May the seventh. Uh, I told you it was ten dollars a piece, and for a table of ten, it was a hundred dollars. We have an anonymous donor that's giving half of that amount right now. So if you're still interested in going, we can make that all happen for you. But I need to know right away because I have to turn this in by May the seventh, is it? May the second. I have to have it in by May the second, so I need to know by next Saturday. I won't go. Believe it or not, we had lots of pots and pans back there on the back table, and some of you took those home, and there was three times as many back there now than there was my <laughs> We've got more clothes, gloves, umbrellas, hats for those who ladies we need a hat. There's all kinds of things back there, but we need to get that off that table. That, that table has become an, an essential part of our, our worship on Sunday morning, so please remove that as you can. Well, tonight at 5 o'clock, Matt Harris, do you record about that girl? Hey, it's gonna it's gonna be our ladies' luncheon today, right after church. We like every female in the church. Um, our entertainment, and unfortunately, is gonna have to be cobbled together because our entertainer is sick. We're still gonna have wonderful food. We're gonna talk about some of our ladies' groups in the church. And see, June is ready. She's got her hat on. Um, if you don't have a hat, we have a few extras, but it's not a necessity. We are taking donations for the uh, campership scholarships for our youth, for our church group. So. Okay, thank you, Karen. Are you ready for it? Sure. May 16th will be our annual Change the World Day. It's a, it's a National United Methodist project, but we've tried to coordinate something here locally. So we met this past week. Um, at this time, we have three projects. We'll do a riverbank cleanup right here on the east side of Fellowship Hall, if you're interested in that. We'll do some type of a sewing project in the Fellowship Hall, um, the lower level like we've done in the past. And we also will do a, the youth will do a car wash in the north parking lot. So those are three activities we have planned so far. We have invited um, the other cluster churches. If they would like to add additional activities, um, they may do so. We'll get that information to you. Should be something in the bulletin next week. We'll start a sign-up sheet. And we'll also have a continental breakfast to kick it off. Um, so we'll need uh, donations for that. It will run from 8.30 to 11 on May 16th. Thank you. Scared me. I thought you know we got the part about the food. <laughs> got to have that involved. All right. Other announcements for our group this morning. Max and Becky players will be here in this sanctuary. Thursday night at 7.30. This is a free Right. Am I taking something away from Ryan? I'm sorry. Am I taking something? Am I taking your announcement away from you? No, it's okay. This is a, this is a free season? No, this is the first. This is the first one. Regular show of the season is, uh, is Thursday evening, uh, 7.30 here. Uh, we'll have
sleep. You better have a good bedtime snack before you go to bed. You're going to sleep for 22 hours. What about the opposite? What animal do you think sleeps the littlest amount? Well, he, that's a good answer, but he's not an animal. We'll come to that next. Good day. I'll give you a hint. He has a really long neck. Giraffe. A giraffe can sleep as little as two hours a day. If I only slept two hours, you would not move me around. Okay. Okay. Okay, so a koala sleeps a long time. A giraffe sleeps a little bit of time. What about God? Do you, sleep, do you think God sleeps during the day or at night? He never sleeps. Is that right, Logan? Yeah? Well, let's see what the Bible says. The Bible says, in Psalm 121, verse 3, He who watches over you will not slumber. In other words, God never sleeps. So when you're sleeping, isn't it nice to know that God never, whether you're sleeping in church, at home, if you fall asleep during math class, whatever, wherever you fall asleep, God's not sleeping, and He's watching over you, and He's protecting you, and He's keeping you safe. So I hope that makes it easier for you to fall asleep tonight, knowing that God never sleeps, and He's always watching you. God, we thank you that you never sleep, that you're always alert and watching over us. Thank you, Father. And may that be um, something that helps us sleep peacefully at night. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
I have asked in the past for prayers for my brother Stephen Cheetah. Um, he is going, we believe, is going through a kidney rejection. He is a um, dual transplant patient um, about 30 years ago, so they have lasted him a really long time. But um, his kidneys are failing now, and it's kind of a, it seems to be kind of a slow progression where he gets almost like in a remission for a little while, and they get his numbers back up. But he, um, we got a message last night that he's retaining fluid in his legs bad, and he's having a struggle with breathing. So um, he is right now in a rehab facility. I wouldn't be surprised if he's probably going to be back in that, but it's shortly. So please just keep him in our prayers. Um, I know mom's struggling with a lot of this. She's planning a European vacation soon, and she hates leaving when he's in bad shape. So um, just please keep him again in prayers for him. He's got to be going through a, I'm afraid of downward spirals. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Steve and Sheila, is put him on your list. Other joy to Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I work with a Baptist minister out at the produce department at Walmart. We call it Produce Alarm, So, But anyway, I had quite an experience the other day. Uh, I have a kind of a knack for pulling love and life out of the Bible. And uh, I was just kind of saying in a short prayer, I said, I was getting ready to say, I am that I am. You know, And all of a sudden, real, like a fraction of a second, it came out. My mouth was open, my eyes were open. I get ready to say, I am that I am. And it came out, I am years of life. And out poured from my heart and my head through my mouth, about 15 seconds was the years of life. And I'm pretty grateful for that experience. Thank you for sharing that. Brother George, would you be kind enough then to take the hand of somebody next to you?
Amen. Of Nazareth, whom you crucified. 
has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Won't you be seated, please? Would you bow your heads please, and let's uh, prepare ourselves for today's meeting. Lord, we are blessed that we have an opportunity to be in any of your sanctuaries and synagogues around our great nation and our, and our world. We have chosen this day to come. Is there anything more difficult on the ego than rejection? Anybody in the room never been rejected? Okay, and this message is for you. Because we all have been turned down, turned away, turned aside in some capacity, in some way. Rejection isn't something we lie, but it's something that we inevitably deal with. From, from time to time. And I suspect that the opposite of rejection is what married couples enjoy themselves for because you're out of the dating game. Remember those awkward years when you, as ladies, had to turn down a guy or as a guy you were a little hesitant about asking that particular favorite girl and then you got turned down. I hated my high school years for that. I could, I could do without it. I like to go back to the scores, but I don't want to go back to that. that portion of it. Rejection. Happens all the time, doesn't it? And if you, you need to develop some sort of a thick skin on yourself, because if you don't know how to handle rejection at our age now, then we're, we're in deep trouble. Have you heard about the news question on the dating game? Not the game you see on television, but what singles are going through today. Typically, the male of the species is the one who approaches the woman. And guys over the years have made up these pickup lines, you know, to interest uh, the woman that they're attracted to. But what if she's not attracted to you? And she doesn't want to embarrass you or to crush your ego in a public place, what does she do? Well, here's where the new twist comes in. Typically, you try to get her, her telephone number, or you can call her the next day, but, you know, giving out false telephone numbers is not new. It's been going on ever since we've been telephoned. So what does she do? The guy goes up, tries to get the number. She gives him a number. He thinks he's hit the jackpot. The next morning he calls and finds out he has recalled, he has called a rejection hotline number. And the hotline number says this, hello, this is not the person you were trying to call. You've reached the rejection hotline. Unfortunately, the person who gave you this rejection hotline phone number did not want you to have her real number. And then the voice goes up, it's a very rude voice, and it goes on to tell you everything that's wrong with you that she may or may not have found in your person. Um, isn't that a turn down? Rejection, and you, and you get to hear it on the telephone, in the rejection hotline. Well, that happens to a lot of people. It happens to all of us from time to time. You apply for a job, and you think you're the right fit for the company, yet your employer has another idea. You're at work, 
you come up with a great idea, you begin to process it, develop it, and take it to your boss, and she says, no, I'd like to hear your co-worker's idea on the same thing as well. Here are some examples. Ken Taylor's para paraphrased version of the Living Bible was rejected 63 times before it was finally published. The Diary of Anne Frank. How many of you have ever seen that? Oh, Black and White Tibetan in 1959? Was rejected 15 times and called dull. Chicken Soup for the Soul. How many of you have at least one of those books on your show? Everybody has that one? It was written by Jack Canfield and Mark Hansen. was rejected 140 times before it finally went into publication. Stephen King, how many know him? I wrote the word disturbing in there because if you've ever seen Carrie, it is a disturbing movie. It was rejected 30 times. He threw it in the trash can. His wife fished it out. Steven Spielberg, how many know who he is? Director, applied to the film schools at UCLA and, and USA, was rejected. Look what he's come up with. Indiana Jones series, Schindler's List, Jaws, War of the Worlds, E.T., Jurassic Park. Seems to do okay for himself after rejection. Fred Astaire had his first screen debut test at MGM. The casting director wrote this memo, cannot act, slightly balding, but can dance a little. <laughs> wow. Did that guy miss it? Charles Schultz, Peanuts fame. Every cartoon that he drew was rejected by his school's yearbook staff. I may remember this guy. He would have been president of the United States if he had been born here in America, but he was born in first Germany. He's best remembered by his classmates as the kid that nobody wanted to eat lunch with at school. Take heart, ladies and gentlemen, some of the best in their fields have been rejected from time to time. Even our master was rejected. Now we've been reading <clears throat> this morning in Acts 4, and we read this together, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the head corner stone. Now before I go any further, let me tell you, I'm going to use capstone, keystone, and the cornerstone interchangeably. They, they mean the same. Let me recap what's going on up to this point when we, we come in kind of at the end of the story. Previous to this reading, a lame man who had been carried to a particular gate that goes into the city, and the gate was called Beautiful. His family and his friends had taken him there. In other parts of the Bible, said that he was over 40 years of age, so for four decades, they had been taking this guy, hauling him down, and laying him at this particular gate where he was allowed to beg. Now that's the first century's equivalent to the welfare program. Can't work, can't stand, can't walk, and he is made to beg. And when this poor man sees Peter and John about to enter the gate, and Scripture said they were there about, about the ninth hour, which would be about three o'clock in the afternoon. So hang on to that one for a moment. About three o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John are on their way into the synagogue to pray. Now remember, this is the transition period. They're not called Christians just quite yet. There's not, there's not that movement there. And so John and Peter are still going back to their synagogue to offer a prayer. The prayer is good for us at any time and any place. But we can do that. And so the lame man sees Peter and John entering through the gate and he begs them for money. And boy, did he get a surprise. Peter turned to this man and said, Gold and silver I have none. Now what's that? Rejection. Because he's there to beg. Peter says, I don't have either of those things, but what I do have, I will give you. That in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And the scripture says that Peter offers them, the, the lame man, his hand, and he pulls him up. So somewhere between Peter saying that and Peter offering his hand to raise up, the power of the Holy Spirit has come into this particular lame man and has strengthened his ankles and his legs and his feet. And Scripture goes on to say that he leapt for joy. He was dancing in the sight of all these people who had seen him out there for 40 years, begging, and knew why that he was there. He was one happy man.
man. Now, the Sadducees are the ruling group of the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin is, is, is like your church council. But the, the Sadducees are the group that's in charge of the Sanhedrin at this time, and they don't like what Peter and John were saying. And so they have them arrested and thrown into jail. Now, why do the Sadducees not like to see miracles and not like to hear what Peter and John were saying? You see, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. That's why they are sad, you see. Don't believe in the resurrection. So when they hear Peter and John say, well, this man was healed by the resurrected Jesus Christ, they're going, no, 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 no. This is not happening. Because Peter and John are speaking against, against one of their core values, their core beliefs. And so they bring him and they arrest them. And then the next day it says that Peter was being interrogated. And the Sadducees say to, to Peter, by what power or by what name have you done this? And instead of answering their questions, Peter takes advantage of the opportunity to do a little preaching. Now remember, I said that it's, they were walking into the gate at about the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon. In other portions of the scripture, it said that he preached until dark. So he had about a four or five hour sermon. Well, let me stop there and say, you can praise God that your preacher doesn't preach for four hours at any one time. Peter explained that whatever they saw him doing was not accomplished by his own power or by his own strength. It was by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Peter also reminded them that this act of healing of a lame man is an act of kindness. And surely you're not going to arrest us because we've done something kind. We did to someone who had raised them up, who had cured them of his malady. Surely kindness should take precedence over rules and regulations. It's Peter who has confirmed that the, the lame man was now healed, was completely healed in the name of Jesus Christ, and it's the same Jesus Christ that we're, we're talking about whom the religious leaders had crucified. But Peter said that was fulfilled by Scripture. Now, stop a moment. That would be about like you being arrested, and then you turn around and accuse the judge for being there for his, for his misconduct. This is Peter at his best and he is at his boldest because we read his sermon, at least a portion of it. We only get 107 words of that that he's talking about. And Peter further elaborates by repeating the beautiful verses expressed in Psalm 112 that he says, the stone that you builders rejected the stone that you builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. He said, Jesus Christ, temporarily humbled, subsequently glorified, is now the Redeemer, and that no one comes to the Father but by the power of Jesus Christ. Let's elaborate. First of all, Jesus, the stone the builders rejected, is now the cornerstone of our faith. Let me elaborate just a little bit more before we get out of here this morning on the importance of a cornerstone, a keystone, or a capstone in the course of building buildings or large structures. The cornerstone is not simply a decorative stone used to finish off a corner or the top of an arch. It is not a bit of architectural flair at all. It's the fundamental stone that, holds, that makes the whole thing work. And if you take that cornerstone, that capstone, out of that structure, it will collapse. It's intended that. I tried to find an old Roman-esque arch, and this is the one that I was able to come up with. That capstone, or the cornerstone, or the keystone, at the top of that arch, is there for a specific purpose. Both of those sides come up and they lean against that capstone. And if that capstone is not there, it will collapse into it. It has to be there to support the entire structure. You remove that stone, it falls down. Make no mistake about it, Peter knows exactly what he's saying when he says Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. That you builders rejected. That has now become the cornerstone of our faith. Legend says that concerning
concerning the events that took place in the building of Solomon's temple, massive temple. The legend is that it was built in silence, that there was no sound of hammers or chisels to be heard when they put that thing together. The reason is because the plans were so exact that each stone was perfectly shaped at the quarry. And when the, when the stones arrived, all they had to do was put them together, like a jigsaw puzzle. But there was one huge stone that came at an odd time, didn't seem to fit anywhere, and the builders placed it aside, didn't know what it was for. It eventually got in the way, and so the builders ordered that that stone be rolled down the hill, and actually it ended up down in what is what's called the Kidron Valley. It was literally rolled downhill into the valley. Well, when they got to the point where they were really ready to make the arch work, they were looking for this cornerstone. They couldn't find it, so they sent runners back to the quarry and said, where's, where's the cornerstone? And the masons there said, well, we sent that to you weeks ago. It's already been delivered. It was at that point that they finally deducted that the stone that had been rejected, the stone that had been ruled down into the Kidron Valley, was exactly what they did. So they returned it, and they put it into place, and it fit perfectly into that structure. It held all other things in its proper position. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, Luke knew this legend. Luke knew what he was reading about out of the book of Psalms. And he puts it all together and decides that this is an apt description of Jesus Christ. Jesus was rejected by the Jewish leaders of his day. But he is the only foundational rock in which we can build our lives. Mark it down, please. If you need to write it down, please do so. Jesus is the only reliable foundation stone that we have that will get us into eternity. Story about a young woman who knows the controversy of being the rejected person. I'll tell you who she is at this point. She writes this. I'm the second child of my mother who was a single mom. When she gave birth to me, she decided that she never wanted me. And so just like Moses, I was placed in a basket as Moses was placed in a basket and sent down river, I was placed in a basket under a plum tree in my father's front yard. The lady was passing by, told my paternal grandmother that I was outside underneath a plum tree. My dad came out, he retrieved me, and his house became my house for the next 22 years. I grew up with my father and my grandmother. Now, let me help you fast forward 24 years. She's a university degree graduate with her second degree, and she writes this. I was doing pretty well despite growing up believing that my mother, uh, that I was my mother's reject. I reconnected with my mom at a seminar. She sought me out because by now she had seven other children, nowhere to live, no job, and no food to give them. The short version is this. <clears throat> I bought her a piece of land. I built a house on it. I found her a job. And I moved my youngest brother in with me so that I could mentor him. He is now a third year law student. The statement made about Jesus Christ being the head cornerstone, the redemptive blood of my Savior and my relationship with him was what helped me to forgive my mother and made it possible for me to become the head cornerstone in her life. She rejected me. She gave me away, and a few later, years later, I was the one she needed most. End quote. Hear her story? Rejected all of her life until she was needed. Her name? Avril Lewis. Head of marketing, former business and managing director, former chief financial officer at H. Or and company in London, England. She, made, she makes a boatload of money, ladies and gentlemen. Can you imagine a human being able to forgive, to forget, and to help, and to become the cornerstone of her family after being rejected for two decades? Only Christ 
can work that miracle in our heart. Back in the days of the Old West, there were many, many pioneers who made their way on the Oregon Trail. And when they got to the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains, they found that there was a stream there that was a little too wide to jump across. So they went downstream a little bit, and they found that there was a large rock out there in the middle, so they could jump from the one bank to the rock to the next bank. Are you with me? They used that rock as a, as a jump off point. Many, many people did that. Years passed, so the pioneers settled in that area. They built their cabins, they strung fences, they plowed the fields, and this one particular man built his cabin near that stream. The problem was he wasn't a really good contractor, and he had a door that kept opening and shutting in the wind. And you know what he did? He went down to the stream, and he pulled that rock out, and he used it as a doorstop. Many years passed. Railroads were built across our nation. More people pushed west. Modern cities were built. The nephew of the man that owned the cabin that had the rock that held the door open and closed decided he wanted to be a geologist. And so the uncle sent him back east for training. He returned four years later to his uncle's home. <clears throat> and lo and behold, on the front porch of his uncle's cabin, that stream was not just an ugly lump of rock, not just a heavy lump, but it was the largest nugget that has ever been found on the eastern Rockies of gold. It was a stepping stone, and it was a doorstop until somebody discovered what it was. Nobody saw it any differently than a lump of rock something to jump off of and hold the door. Only the nephew saw it for what it was actually truly was. The same is true of Jesus Christ. Rejected, turned down, crucified between two thieves, died a thief's death on Calvary's cross. But the same Jesus Christ has also been a stumbling block for a lot of people because they can't understand, they can't see, they can't find the worth that he offers us in eternity. We know him as the precious stone. We know him as the redeemer. We know him as the chief cornerstone of our eternity. The only reliable foundational rock that we have in our lives. Would you bow your head? <clears throat> Often we just we just need to go back to the foundation. We need to go back to the building principle.
545 in the on the screen. Mm -hmm. so the odd number of verses, please. One, three, and five. If you would stand with me, please. The church is one foundation.